Hey guys, Daniel here for That Pedal Show and I'm absolutely delighted today to have John Stockman from Carnival with us. And uh, thank you so much for coming in, it's just uh, so great. Yeah, she's... And uh, so we're going to spend some time looking at John's rig and his pedals and his sounds. But I just want to take a few minutes and uh, just discuss with you how you've come to where you are now. Mm -hmm. um, listening to the sounds on the albums and your sound has progressed a, a great deal. So how did you get started with the textural element of your sound? Yeah, it's, um, I guess it would go back to when I first joined the band, um, I was playing a four string mm -hmm. <clears throat> with a B tuning on it. It was actually these three strings, it was like a B, F sharp, B, and then a G right. on a four string. So I was turning into a bow and arrow pretty rapidly. And um, uh, I had been given this old uh, Boss uh, multi effects, like an ME6, oh, yeah. I think, yeah, the yeah. guitar one, yeah. that Drew had. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I'd just have some fun with it. Mm. And um, it was really only delays and, and stuff like that, that that I was really messing around with him. But I was sort of became interested in like the percussive sort of elements you can get with delays and right. setting up beats and stuff with that. Do you have a, a delay thing that you could show us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, sort of, sort of the basis for something yeah. like the. It's sort of subtle, so it just sort of it doesn't it doesn't uh, sort of ride over the top of anything else mm -hmm. too um, too too much. So it's sort of is able to sit under everything, which is you know wor working with delays and bass. You've got to be really conscious of the register sure. when it comes to feedback. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, you know, it's, re it's really hard to do stuff down low and make it sound musical or, or clear, I guess. Sure, and, and not just become overrun with everything else that's going on as yeah, well. Yeah, just a wall of sludge. <laughs> sure. <underneath. laughs> yeah. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, from there, we went, then we, um, I think it was around the time we were doing our second record, mm -hmm. um, we got a lot more experimental with the bass sounds mm -hmm. because uh, it was quite a sort of standard sort of approach with Samata. There wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't too much going on apart from maybe a distortion you know, sure. and, and delays and sure. a little bit of reverb sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we just sort of got a bit more creative. We got a bit, our know-how with, um, with sort of recording software was sort of uh, becoming a little bit better than novice as well. So we okay. were getting into plugins and messing around with sound. So um, yeah, so I started getting into tremolos and, um, and when I got uh, a tremolo, this eventide mod factor for mm -hmm. the tremolo for the called Lua. Right. Um, I got it because I could MIDI sync it mm -hmm. to the click that we, we would be running. Right. So, because I wasn't aware before that that tremolos aren't something that can just start. Okay. Music, like they're just constantly going. Yes. So you turn it on and it'll be just then constantly out are. of phase, <laughs> so to speak, with the with the BPM or whatever. So I got it for that, and then through that, I um I, I started messing around with like the uh, ten or not nine other effects that are actually on that thing, and right. and developing some other other you know things, and um, also working between a distorted sounds mm -hmm. and and sort of weird sort of sharp sounds like mm. for stuff like We Are as well. See, I was gonna, I was gonna come to We Are. Um, I think it's, it's a fantastic example. And I'll just say, if you guys haven't heard this song now, just pause this then open up in another window. Don't shut this window down, because that would be rude. Just open up in a separate window and search We Are Carnival and check it out. And now the reason I want to ask you about that, I think that's a, a fantastic example of you setting up the groove using the effects, so you've got the tremolo effect then back into that distorted mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. and it sets the whole thing up. And there's, a, there's a number of times you, uh, that you do that, but We Are is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so is that a song that you wrote and then you came up with that, or is that something they brought that to the table and you said, well, you know, let's, let's try this as a riff? Yeah, it actually, well, it was um, the, the day I got this 
thumb bass. We were playing a gig in Carnarvon, right. up a, you know, in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. And I just went down and messed around and I sort of came up with this riff that was nothing like that. It was like this uh, sort of thing, yeah. which I ended up using for the, um, the uh, what was it, like a version, when we did the like a version for Triple J and we yeah, had to yeah. do We Are acoustically. Uh -huh. that. Okay. And it also comes in handy when, so, so, a few times when um, this pedal has malfunctioned live. <laughs> I'll just go to that instead, so um, it's a good sub, but yeah, so basically we're doing that and we did a lot of jam, the song really started to flesh out all mm. around these sort of uh, ideas, that none, none of which are now in the song, and then that wow. that tremolo thing was something that sort of happened it's when we were stuck. sort of jamming. So one of the things about your bass sound, in general, I think a lot of guitar players don't understand this, that unless you get the bass tones right, um, you can try and be as heavy as you like with the guitars, mm. unless you get those, the core bass tones, the overdrive bass tones right, it's never going to be as deep, those guitar sounds, mm. unless it's sitting on top of the perfect platform. Mm -hmm. um, uh, King Crimson, Red, really good example. Uh, even, even David Lee Roth, Eat Him and Smile, the Billy Sheehan bass tone mm. on that mm. album is completely supportive of all the, the guitar tones, but You're without right. that, yeah. it wouldn't be as heavy. That's right. Yeah. And with what you do, the um, you know Drew and Hoss's tones on the album, they can get heavy, but without what you were doing, there would be nowhere near the amount of depth and and punch and that just the, the overall girth factor of, yeah. the, of the songs. <laughs> girth factor. Death girth yeah. factor. <laughs> the girth factor. Um, so, so is this something that you're conscious of as far as when the boys are? If there's a section that, that goes really heavy, um, are you specifically trying to say, okay, we're going to make this as deep and as heavy as possible by supporting the guitars with this sound? Yeah, it, it's really a song by song sort of case sort, sure. of, sort of thing. Like sometimes, say something like Simple Boy, mm. um, that was sort of be, began around the bass and the drums mm. in, in a way. And because it was so overbearingly heavy, it sort of pushed the guys up to, to naturally want to do some more sort of atmospheric stuff right. to all over the top. Mm -hmm. But when we are all playing together, um, and we and then we're really like pushing some, you know, some, the lowest sort of registers of our in instruments. It's really important for me, where if I'm using a, an overdrive, that it's somehow fitting in in other places. Okay. Where the guitars aren't, so right. that effectively they can be heard, mm. but we're not competing for the same frequencies sure. or sort of same sort of timbres. Sure. Even that, and so that we sort of it's more like kind of like their EQ and my EQ is like a kind of teeth in a zipper, right? Kind of thing. So it, it's all because they are very distinctive tones when you hear them together. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, they, it just works so beautifully. I mean. Do you ha can you give us an example of, of um, say an overdrive tone that you might use that, that works in that meshing? Yeah, um, I think yeah. So like if I'd, I'd be doing like sort of thing. And that's amazing because you're playing that on your low B string, but it still has so much clarity mm. to it. Mm. That's Fantastic. Yeah, it's really. I mean, it's really important with uh, bass. Like, and I've I figured out. I figured this out way too late. Um, like, I was nearly going to throw the original pedal I had, which was just this Boss Overdrive, mm. out because I didn't understand the whole clean, wet mix thing. So, right. So with this, with these sort of, with these pedals, I see mm. I've got a couple on here. Um, most of the time, it's nearly all dry. Right. So it just bleeds in enough. Of the distortion, so it doesn't lose any of that bottom end. So it's not all the signal isn't going all through the pedal. You yeah. just it's a wet dry mix. Your yeah. So that's wow. how you because it just seems to wreak havoc. Sure. On the bottom end, the you know the, the longer wavelengths and stuff seem to just get eaten up by the, and not spat out the other side. Right. So if you've got the balance of the clean, it, it, it doesn't feel like when you step it on that you lose volume. You get sure. you're still maintaining the the same uh, the, the dynamics from your clean sound. Right. So yeah, there's a. I mean, some of the other pedals I've got don't seem to have to 
have that have that effect as much like mm. I've got over here. This uh, B seven K microtubes and that the blend on that works really well. Right. Uh, like at the full um, uh, sort of turning of that pot mm -hmm. like on, on maximum it's it's at the same sort of blend level that's usable. It's like they've they've worked out where the blend is actually usable to a point and that's as far as it goes. I know that uh, you use that extensively and yeah on uh, especially on asymmetry mm. um, when because I'd, I'd gotten the pedal just before that and um, it was just such a versatile little pedal for all the sounds mm. that I needed to get mm. and occasionally I'd use one of the other sort of setups that I'd, I'd sort of developed for sound awake but mm -hmm. I mean even just getting like there's a couple of there's a couple of clean tones on that record that I was really happy to get because mm. I was sort of thinking after Sound Awake, oh, maybe a good thing to focus on would be a really meaty, nice, warm sound, like clean sound that's not doesn't have to be, you know, going gangbusters and mm. just the, the, a little bit of that. As can we well. hear? Can we hear some of that? Yeah. Uh, so if I put it, through, where are we? So it's kind of is it sort of set to that now? Nearly. Nearly. It's probably probably set a little bit the way I would have it, but right. um I just feel like that. Probably sky machine stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Just uh, Just that it was really nice and warm and wasn't just a, a direct big clean signal line. Sure. It had a slight little character. Beautiful, beautiful. <coughs> um, so another question that we've been asked, um, your EQing and how you approach live versus studio. Mm -hmm. How does that change? Uh, well, dr drastically, I think um, anything you do in a studio, you can start there when you go to do a live, mm. and then you're gonna invariably have to adjust stuff. And uh, Willie, our sound guy, has been a great help right. with that, um, with my sound mm -hmm. sort of developing over the years. My understanding of what is actually happening and what's going on, right. why things suck when they do. Okay. And um, so what we'll do is uh, you, you record an album in a perfectly treated room, very controlled, very controlled, yeah. and you can really get some really awesome sounds mm. that, that don't feed back. Right. <laughs> and then you go to a nice big uh, square room and suddenly you have to adjust sure. things and, and sort of EQs regarding bottom end as well mm. for some effects that sort of, especially with the bass. Sure. But, um, <clears throat> so one of the things I do, I should maybe explain my, my signal path. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sort of so I go into a tuner first mm -hmm. as a bypass mm -hmm. because uh, in the past, I had it at the very end, so I could kill signals mm -hmm. going to the amp. But mm -hmm. I can pretty much just do that, and it kills any trails if I if I need to. Sure. So, what I do there, I go into the tuner, mm -hmm. and then underneath it goes into a little later P split. Okay. Um, the orange one, and it's passive, so it doesn't need to be powered. Okay. So there's no power. If it, you know, there's no chance that that's going to fail. Sure. Due to power, sure. and then uh, it gets split. One way to a, uh, so I'll just lift this up here so you can see. So yeah, it goes out here and it goes, one one goes to this JDI. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's um, so that Luke can really put a bit more bottom end into what's going on. So he's getting a direct signal with no effects, no effects just straight Just straight clean, okay, yeah. yep. Which um, sometimes he, he can't use, as you can imagine, for things like tremolo effects. Yeah. Because it's... Oh, it'll be just this with this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, that is it's also kind of a backup. Okay. If everything like dies, you've still got that. You still got something okay. yeah, out yeah. the front, and then split, and it goes to this EQ before mm -hmm. the um, gig rig, and that's where I set. That's sort of like a room control based. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so I can set it to whatever the room in conjunction with this. Right. Um, you know, if it's really boomy or whatever, and it's, it's heaps of 100 hertz sort of chesty 
sort of thing, mm -hmm. I can pull it out. Sure. And uh, generally, I pull a lot of that out anyway because this lovely little guy loves to uh, loves to just push that out. So okay. Um, you're all, now you're just to diverge a bit. Yeah. You're always using six string basses. I mean, I haven't seen you use anything else. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a, a a sneaky photo on a, on a somewhere. There was a jazz bass in the in the corner, um, but you're specific. You're only using these, so you yeah. Well, going things? back to the early days when I had the four string, yeah. and it was yeah becoming a quiver sort right. of or not a bow. Um, I figured I needed to get another string between this G and the B because I could never play the fifth there. I'd have to play it there. That was right. like the and it was always like a bit of a jump. So I thought we just play it there, okay. like a normal guitar. So I wanted to get a five string so I could put that um, string between. Right. They didn't have any, so uh, he said, we've got a six string, I was like, oh, yeah, all right, sweet, <laughs> let's, let's go with that.